everyone and welcome jo to join us on discussing the mental health in the framework of the Mental Health Month in a modern educational complex named in the honor of Haydar Relief in Baku, Azerbaijan. My name is Tatiana Mikhailova and I am moderating tonight's session and it's my great honor to introduce you to our speakers. Janet Ferron, and who is the mental health expert, and Dale Carberry, who is the senior lecturer in a special education. And our next speaker is Orhan Oruch, who is the psychologist. And our guests here in the audience in Baku, Gwen Burchow, who is the positive parenting expert, Ali Mardanov, who is the training and coach, and Mr. Raymond Finch, senior advisor to the MTK and international school principal. Thank you all for being with us today. I would rather jump to the questions immediately. And uh, this is what I just addressed, is why people are sometimes so reluctant to talk about the mental health. What makes us stopping? Is it something we feel shy about? And this is a question I would like to address to both of the, our panelists, to Janet and Dale. So shall we start from Janet first? Hi hey everyone, I'm delighted to be here and it really is an important topic to address uh, because globally mental health, particularly for adolescents, has become quite an issue but it hasn't been spoken about because of a stigma. There's a lot of cultural bias. A lot of people will seek help for a medical diagnosis, but when it comes to mental health, there really is that stigma that it's kept under the rug. We don't want anyone in, to think someone in our family is crazy. So it actually makes the situation worse because the people who are suffering don't feel like they can really express themselves and it plays out in many ways with gender again with culture uh, with different income classes so it, it's really time to break the stigma and have some open discussions about this like we are today we as parents and I'm the parent of the three kids and we as educators are facing the same issues all over the world. I'm so happy that Azerbaijan right now is addressing this important issue which is not raised by some other countries yet. But you're coming from the international background. So tell me like, you know, with your observations, how similar we are in like talking about this or the opposite, trying to kind of like, you know, hide the conversation sometimes. So um, I was looking at some statistics, um, UNICEF worldwide statistics, talking about one in five adolescents will experience um, a mental disorder every year. And the frightening statistic is that it's the second leading uh, suicide is the second leading cause of death for girls and the third leading cause of death for boys ages 15 to 19. And in, additionally, depression is considered one of the leading causes of disability in that age group. So we are all facing um, the pandemic, the isolation that's that's gone on. I know in your countries, as well as mine in the US, students have been out of school. They're missing that social interaction. Um, you also have gone through a, a six week war. Uh, the, you know, the, the stressors that are there are you know, really increasing the amount of depression, anxiety. And as parents, we need to you know, really look and see changes in behavior, see how we can reassure our children, having open conversations, uh, limiting the news. You know, everyone's kind of obsessed with watching and it, it gets into our psyche. So I think it's, this is really, it's a, a national an international pandemic as well as even before the pandemic, an international crisis in the prevalence of mental health issues. Thank you. And my question would be to Dale. Uh, we did some research among the public in terms of the mental health and the issues related to that. So uh, one of the questions was whether people 
um, should work out their own mental health problem without asking for help. And to my great um, happiness, the answer was disagree, meaning that people do understand the importance of asking for the help. So to question to you as a professional uh, person in like, you know, working for over 30 years with the children, what that professional help should be, how it should be like, you know, at what point it should be seeked, what are the signs? Oh, thank you. That's a very important question. Um, and I'm delighted to be here as well today. Um, it's very, I think we all need to realize that we all go through stressors and to different degrees and that some of these stressors are normal everyday life. The, they may be coming from within ourselves or from our environment, but we all share um, many of the, the stressors that, that happen every day in school, at home, and even with, especially with young adults and children within their group of friends. And I think it's important to talk about that when things come up so that children often talk to their parents they often talk to other children, or they very often find an adult within their life, whether it's a coach or a teacher, um, that they can confide in. And many times that's as far as these things really need to go because talking out the situation, children and adults find, oh, other people feel the same way. They have the same kinds of concerns and we can problem solve this and maybe find a solution or some ways to cope. And the coping and the understanding and the problem solving are so important when these issues arise. Very often when I've been in front of a group of children or young adults teaching or mentoring, um, they, they, one person will be brave enough to share a concern or a question and then find to their surprise that most of the people in the room have the same concern or question. And that can be resolved and make everybody's kind of stress level um, come down a little bit. When things get a little bit beyond that and it's interfering with everyday life in children, it might be interfering with their school day. They may be refusing to go to school or they may be very stressed over the amount of work or the, their ability to complete their work to the point where it's interfering with um, their school, their family, their friends. You know, that may be a time when uh, the conversation could perhaps go on to a professional for some more uh, support in that area. Thank you. And I, I think at this point, I'd love to ask for the help and just put the animation, the video we are having for the audience uh, just to watch and then discuss that. Thank you. Uşağların mental sağlamlığına dəstək. COVID-19 pandemiyasının uşaqların hayatına necə təsir etdiyini hamıdan yaxşı valideynlər bilir. Bir çox uşaqlar bu vəziyyata uyğunlaşsa da, qeyri-müəyyənliyin hökum sürdüyü zamanda, onların məktəbdə, dostluq münasibətlərində və gündəlik həyatlarında baş verən dəyişikliklər fərqli hisslərə qapılmalarına səbəb olur. Mütəxəssislər tərəfindən hazırlanmış rifahın yaxşılaşdırılmasına aparan 5 istiqamət yanaşması, hazır ki, mürəkkəb dövrdə uşaqları, həmçinin onlara dəstək göstərən valideyin və müəllimləri faydalı iş strukturu ilə təmin edir. Ünsiyyət qurun Ətraftakılarla ünsiyyət qurun. Uzun müddət görmədiyiniz dostlarınızla görüş təşkil edin. Ümumi maraqları paylaşacağınız dərnəklərə qoşulun. Yaxınlarınızı diqqətlə dinləyin və özlərini ifadə etmələrinə şərait yaradın. Cavab vermək üçün deyil, anlamaq üçün dinləyin. İnsanlarla ünsiyyət qurmağı, həyatımızın təməl daşlarından biri kimi qiymətləndirmək hər birimiz üçün çox faydalıdır. Bunu inkişaf etdirməyə vaxt ayırmaq, özünüzü daha sakit, təhlükəsiz və əmin hiss etməyinizə dəstək olacaq. Aktiv olun. Aktiv olmağın yollarını araşdırın. Qaçın və ya gəzintiyə çıxın. Açıq havada, təbiət qoyununda daha çox vaxt keçirin. Hərəkətli oyunlar oynayın, yaxud rəqs edin. 
Hər gün aktif həyat tərzi sürmək beynimizdə, əhval ruhiyyəmizə müsbət təsir göstərən dəyişikliklərə səbəb olur. İdmanla məşğul olmaq özümüzü yaxşı hiss etməyimizə kömək edir. Ətrafdakılara diqqət ayırın Ətrafdakılara qayğı göstərmək əhəmiyyətlidir. Diqqətinizi yaxınlarınıza yönəldin. Yaxınlarınızı, təbiyyəti, düşüncələrinizi və hisslərinizi dəyərləndirin. Ətrafımızdakı gözəlliyə diqqət yetirin. Baş verən hadisələrə rasional şəkildə yanaşmağınız sizə bu işdə kömək olacaq. Düşüncə və hisslərinizi qələmə alaraq, yaxud malik olduqlarınızı xatırlayıb, şükür edərək mənəvi rahatlıq tapa bilərsiniz. Yaşananların daha çox fərqinə varmaq, həyatınızdakı yaxşı hadisələrdən xəbərdar olmaq və təcrübələrini saxta düşünmək sizin üçün vacib olanları qiymətləndirməyə kömək edəcək. Öyrənməyə davam edin. Yenilikləri sınaqdan keçirin. Əvvəlki hobbinizi yenidən kəşf edin. Hər hansı bir dərnəyə yazılın. Xarici dildə danışmağı və ya musiqi alətində ifa etməyi öyrənin. Özünüzü ifadə edin. Yeni yemək reseptini sınaqdan keçirin. Əvvəlcə kiçik adımlar atmalı olsanız belə, özünüzü həll etməkdən zövq alacağınız hədəflər təyin edin. İnkişaf etmək özünüzə güvənməyə dəstək olacaq. Həm də bu, çox əyləncəlidir. Paylaşın Paylaşmaq, digər insanlara qayğı göstərmək deməkdir. Hətta atılmış kiçik adımlar belə önəmlidir. Dostunuza və ya tanımadığınız bir şəxsə yaxşılıq edin. Təşəkkür etməkdən çəkinməyin. Gülümsüyün, mehriban rəftar edin. Sizdən daha az imkanı olan şəxslərə kömək edin. Dost və tanışlarınızdan özlərini necə hiss etdiklərini soruşun və verəcəkləri cavabları diqqətlə dinləyin. Başqalarına kömək etmək müsbət hisslər yaradır və həyatımızdan daha çox məmnun olmağımızı təmin edir. Mental sağlamlıq hər kəsə aiddir. Həm müsbət, həm də mənfi duyğuları yaşamaq həyatın normal bir hissəsidir. Rifaha aparan 5 yol üzrə tövsiyə olunan vərdiş və davranışları formalaşdırmaqla, övladınızın özünü daha sakit və rahat hiss etməsinə kömək etmiş olacaqsınız. That's great, isn't it? So, um, Raymond, that's not a surprise that I'll be asking you right now. Well, first of all, like, I, I absolutely love the animation because to me this is the initiation of the very important conversation in the society. And we are talking both about the kids and the parents because, you know, these audiences are so much interconnected. And my favorite probably was the brain which makes the exercise because if we adults do understand the connection, between two kids are not so much self-aware so thank you for bringing bringing that and tell me i mean what was the driving force for the mtk i do know that you're the modern school i do know that you're innovative i do know you care about the kids and the parents but what was your driver to to make this animation happening to create that and to, to promote it further Th thank you for the question tatiana and the the, the driver behind it was partly the fact that we looked online and we found lots of wonderful multimedia resources in English and a variety of languages, but there was a, there was a dearth of material in native languages. Um, and so we looked around and we gathered some uh, different research on the subject. And when you start to look into to teens and children's mental health, some of the research is extremely academic on the level it approaches the topic. Uh, some of the advice, it seems like a scattergun where you can't really kind of get any form to it and you, you wonder where to start because there's bits about exercise and bits about diet and bits about human connection. And then we struck upon the, the five ways to well-being, which seemed to be a really nice and relatable uh, framework, which we felt that would um, enable people to, to organize their thoughts about, um, about uh, mental health and to... Yeah, to sort of conceptualize it in a way where you could follow uh, a certain um, codex and, and, and, and set of uh, behaviors. Thank you. Gwen, I think the question would be to you because you're here for like, you know, ages, I would say. Um, what was the behavior change or um, probably some habits change from the parents if they're looking more open for the help right now 
if I mean if they realize that the kid needs the help rather than before at least you know that that was a tendency before it was a kind of like you know I'd better be refraining from that because I'm not quite sure what will happen if they will understand that my kid has got a health uh, issues etc I mean do you see any trends do you see any changes in that I wouldn't say uh, any changes that you can necessarily evaluate, um, but I would say that there is a growing awareness that, um, and especially during this past year, there's a growing awareness that um, parents uh, need to inform themselves more about um, the impact of stress um, on, and anxiety on their children and their family as a whole. Um, because for the, from the parents' perspective, they're losing jobs, um, their, their future is not certain, um, this is creating stress for them, which is coming into the family home. The children aren't in school as a, as a release anymore, as a way to escape it. Um, and so, yes, I do think that there is this growing awareness now um, that uh, that some that they need an out uh, the parents and children all together need more of an outlet they need more um, more uh, uh, listening uh, more opportunities to talk to people who can help uh, help them and give them some answers um, so that's what I've noticed this year is this increasing uh, willingness to reach out of the family and talk to people who are not family members so, yeah. Thank you. Uh, coming back to the brain with the exercising, I think Ali, I would, I would like you know immediately um, ask for your um, expert opinion because apart from being the math teacher, you're also running the movement pl platform. Correct me where yeah. I might be wrong. Correct. Uh, where you're promoting the healthy lifestyle and the active lifestyle. True. And again, you know, more and more people understand the importance of, uh, you know, being active and uh, dynamic, let's put it this way, for the, for the good activity of the brain. Pandemic didn't leave us with lots of the choices. True. So what were the solutions and what will be the solutions? And I mean, because people, most, in most of the cases, we, as humans are looking for the excuses. I mean, I can't go out, I can't do this, I can't do that. So what were your recipes? And I believe that, you know, you lost quite a lot of the people simply because you had to be locked. How was the situation there? Okay, uh, so if we're talking about the sport, uh, we have to look a little bit deeper. Uh, and first thing, everybody know that sport is really helpful, but only little amount of people really know why. So, A, why it is important, uh, because it affects on our hormonal system. Did you know that if you run for 100 meters with uh, your 70% from your maximum speed, your body will start producing dopamine, which uh, affects on your state, on your emotion. It's a hormone which is responsible for happiness, okay? So, uh, but how often do we do that? Not really often. Uh, second thing uh, that uh, sport or any kind of sport activity affects on our cardiovascular system, which affects in result on the uh, flow of the oxygen to our brain. So in clear brain, clear thoughts. Uh, and the third thing that, uh, as you mentioned, uh, there is, must be no excuses. If we know that uh, sport activity is really helpful for our body and for our mental health, so we need to find the way out. So during pandemic, uh, sport industry almost ruined because no sport activities uh, from the uh, professional uh, point of view, from the commercial point of view, but online platform started uh, become more popular and this is something what we did uh, in uh, our platform we started doing the classes online and involving parents and the children to do uh, together 
because uh, we are more about family sport platform and we are trying to involve not only children or only adults, we want them to cooperate. Uh, yes, of course, we make the difference between children and adults, but when they do it together, uh, adult for a child is a kind of role model, especially their parents. So when they see as their parents doing sport, of course, they will try to join them, maybe not in the same way, in a different way. Uh, and uh, the recipe, how to stay uh, mentally healthy, uh, a, of course, you need to do sport. B, you have to be a role model, even if you are a parent. And uh, C, um, did you know that uh, by learning new movement, we affect on our neuroplasticity? So actually, when you brush your teeth with your right hand and you start doing it with your left hand, you create new neuron cells. Okay? So uh, this method affects... Uh, on all area of our lives. And the best way how to stay uh, mentally healthy is to learn something new every day. And the last thing is recovery. Only a little amount of people know how to recover. They know about rest. For some people, this is all about parties. For others, it's all about traveling and going to the mountain and stay alone, do yoga or meditation. But actually, um, for, by my opinion, uh, both of this uh, kind of recoveries are important for children and for adults. So there is a physical recovery and mental recovery. For physical recovery, uh, the amount of sleep and your nutrition. It's not about the diet, but healthy lifestyle. Eat more at the breakfast, eat less for your supper or dinner and uh, for mental recovery it is staying in quiet atmosphere you can name it like meditation or doing yoga whatever but staying quiet during one hour per day uh, when you do not watch any video when you do not look to your phone and answer to the messages just stay at home alone or you just walk and do nothing in this moment, what happens? Uh, everything, all experience which we got through the day kind of fi finds its own place in our brain. In result, we realize it's like kind of conscious approach to the way we live. So this is my recipe. But when, uh, re uh, as I remember, you did the positive parenting program and part, I, I mean, you're still into that. And part of this was promoting the sleep with the kids. I mean, can you just like, you know, quickly, you know, touch on that one, particular on that one? Because yes, I mean, the sleep yeah. is not less important for the mental health rather than movement, probably. Um, well, s when we sleep, that's when our brains have the, have it, has its time to sort of recover itself and process everything that we've been going through during the day. And uh, particularly if a child doesn't get enough sleep, this impacts on their behavior the next day, it impacts on their ability to learn the next day, it impacts on um, their emotional stability. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a common trend in some countries, including in Azerbaijan, that children stay up very, very late um, and maybe don't get the full amount of sleep that they need during the nighttime, during the dark hours. And it's dark hours when we're meant to sleep, yeah? Um, so, uh, and I think that um, this is something that's not... Uh, it's, it's cultural for the child to stay up with the family, for them all to spend time together, uh, which is lovely, yeah? I mean, it's a great thing. But at the same time, if the child is showing, uh, is taking in stress, is, is, is struggling at school because of stress, one of the quickest and easiest remedies that a parent can uh, take is uh, ensuring the child gets their 10 hours sleep a night, goes to bed when it's getting dark and, and sleeps properly the full night. This is also great for the family as well because then the parents have some nice peaceful time <laughs> to relax, as you said, you know, have that hour of complete peace and quiet for their own 
uh, mental health uh, to recover after a challenging day. So yeah, for me, sleep is such a crucial issue for, for all our mind and body functions. And Orhan, probably I will be talking to you next. How, like, you know, how often you see probably the people who bring the other people to you? I mean, in, as a matter of help, not only like saying, oh yes, I feel sorry for you, or like, Shh, you know, he or she has got something, but more is like, you know, hey, doctor, we need to talk to you, there is an issue. And what are the trends you're seeing with the mental health right now? Yeah. Um Actually, when one of our friends is struggling uh, with uh, anxiety, uh, it can leave us worried about their well-being um, and disappointed that we are not able to see each other as much as we would like. Uh, it can also affect our friendship, especially the, if we aren't sure how to support them and when they really need someone. And knowing how to support a friend who is dealing with uh, anxiety can definitely be confusing um, we might uh, have a hard time relating to what they are going through or we might be concerned uh, about saying the right or maybe wrong uh, thing and while while there is no any the rule book for helping a friend with anxiety there are things you can do to uh, show your support and make the situation a little easier for uh, both sides, both of you, and uh, let them know that uh, you understand that anxiety is very real and very difficult, and uh, that that is uh, makes the sense uh, that they are struggling, even if their specific worry seems uh, unrealistic uh, to you, uh, chances are you can find something to validate how tough it must be uh, to worry about the future or how unco uncomfortable the physical symptoms of anxiety must be. Despite our best intention, minimizing the situation or our friend's anxiety is rarely helpful. We might think that uh, pointing uh, out that things aren't so bad, scary or dangerous is a way to be supportive or calm them down. But when someone is anxious, they, they are rarely receptive to this kind of feedback. On, some level, our friends usually know their anxiety isn't totally rational, or um, so this reality check uh, it isn't giving them any new information and can feel insensitive. Uh, saying things like calm down, relax, or it is not a big deal can also uh, come across uh, as uh, invalidating and make your friend feel like you are blaming them for being overly sensitive, even uh, if they are meant to be supportive. And supporting a friend who is struggling with anxiety isn't easy, actually. And after a while, it can really affect uh, on your own uh, well-being. Um, and uh, remember to take care of yourself by making time for self-care and setting uh, boundaries or limits as needed. This might uh, mean changing uh, the way you you relate to your friends, like taking time for yourself or spending time with other friends or setting limits on the kinds, uh, kinds of things you talk about or how when you went to each other. And uh, taking yourself will make you, you a better friend uh, in the long run. Thank you. That also brought me to the thought that we have been discussing several times. Janet, um, we had a question, one of the questions in the questionnaire was uh, about the stigmas. And one of the stigmas we talked about that people who experience mental strain or mental illnesses are usually violent and dangerous. And people were not really sure what to answer because they were not like, you know, kind of um, whether it's yes or no. I would love you to elaborate on that, but also the other stigmas which you've been seeing through your experience, through your expertise, and I'm sure there are a number of them which are actually stopping us some time to see the reality, to address it and help, uh, help the others. 
Yes, there, I, I saw uh, from the survey that there is that misconception about the violence connected with mental health. I think what happens is there's a news story where someone has done something violent and they happen to also perhaps have um, you know, depression or mental health issues or perhaps autism. There's anything that gets latched onto it. And then people think, oh, I saw that story. That person did this, so that group of people do this. But it's really not. The, the statistics are very low in terms of people with mental health acting out violently. So, um, you know, it's, it's just one of those things that are easy to, um, to latch on to. And people, I think it makes them feel better because they can say, well, I don't have that, or you know, my family member is not mentally ill, so you know, we're we're immune to that. It's only those people. The other thing that I think for teenagers, um, I I assume it's it's pretty universal that they're always with a telephone, at least in the U.S. And some of the things that really work for them that remove the stigma is being able to go online to an app. Uh, there's different uh, mindfulness apps, Headspace, Calm, where kids can de-stress. I know in, when I worked with a group of students with depression and anxiety, they loved coloring. It was that soothing kind of um, activity. And there's apps on the phone, I think one called Recolorify, but you can just you know, use, um, pick the colors and make these pretty things. When I was working with the students and talking with them, I found myself grabbing one of the coloring pages and <laughs> joining in and it, it was great yeah actually is that um to pick up on a point made by janet people who are mentally ill are far more likely to be the victims of crime mm -hmm. than the perpetrators of crime um, and that's one of the reasons why we asked that question in the survey to try and get you know attitudes about that and to uh, to highlight that issue thank you there is one question which is not only in framework of International Women's Day, because it's triggering me, and we've talked about you know, that with Gwen when we just were coming. I mean, we, we talk about the women and the, uh, the gender and women as suffering the most through the pandemic. But the, the, it says that the men and the women are both equally likely to experience mental health problem. I would refrain from commenting that myself, but would love to ask the specialist, very short, I mean, what was your opinion? I think it's a, it's a tough question because we all look at each other a little bit differently, female, male, genders. Um, I, I'm not surprised when people think that women um, have issues of anxiety, depression type mental health issues more than men. Um, and that perhaps it's their lifestyle, especially now um, where women are working full time, raising children at home with the children and working and doing a lot of the chores around the house. Um, however, I totally believe that it's pretty equal and that we, that women are more apt to talk about it, to talk to their friends about it, um, to be less embarrassed by it when they're having difficulty, and it may be more um, more visual in their appearance and how they act than men. But men also have the same issues. They have a lot of anxiety around their work, around their family, around their relationships, um how they're going to support themselves and others during the pandemic or even before and after the pandemic um, and they just most likely express it less it may be um that it's not as acceptable for a man to talk about these issues it may be that it's not as acceptable within their group of peers to discuss such things rather than sports um, it's, I think it's just a cultural kind of gender norm that we fit into where it looks like women may have more of an issue 
um, with these with these issues. However, they also talk about it more, so they're probably coping better in many ways than men are. But I would say equal. Yeah, I, I would agree with Dale that um, everybody is impacted. Um, in general, and then, you know, with the layer of this pandemic. And we do talk about the women and, uh, you know, economically, they've suffered the most having to leave their jobs or their jobs in the service industry being curtailed because things aren't open. But then the flip is, then there is, as Dale pointed out, the man being the only breadwinner is now experiencing stress around that and probably the woman saying, hey, you got to help me in the house, you know. Um, so I think um, the, the studies do show, I believe, equal numbers. And Dale, you know, beautifully pointed out the different coping mechanisms. One of the things that we really see is that the men um, using more of um, alcohol to kind of, you know, cope with the feelings, make the feelings go away. So the substance abuse issue comes into play a lot when uh, when we're talking about men. Uh, the actual men who has problems the affect uh, affect uh, women and the men equally, but some are common uh, among the women. Um, various social factors put women at greater risk uh, of poor mental health than men, um, especially the in. in kind of the countries like Azerbaijan, the essential that women look after their mental health, uh, although the busy lifestyle, lifestyles often makes this difficult, difficult uh, because traditionally women have tended to take uh, responsibility of looking after the health of the family members. Uh, then for, for instance, women may shop work for their family and uh, those uh, what they are eat or manage what they the family do when they feel unwell and this role makes it particularly important that women understand how uh, choices we all make in everyday life can affect our mental health thank you uh, gwen you are also the specialist on the early intervention mm -hmm. and saying that is the mental health issues are so much invisible mm -hmm. this is like you know kind of disability which you can't probably see because you know in the physical case you you're clearly seeing that what would, would be your advice probably to the parents to address to check up on the as early as possible where is that we are not to lose that like you know opportunity to catch it where when it should be caught I mean, the early intervention. Um, well, my advice wouldn't be so much to the parents about picking up on these issues. My advice would be to the service providers in the health and uh, particularly in health facilities, um, because the impact of uh, adverse childhood experiences, so the stress, the COVID, the pandemic, the war, uh, alcoholism, substance abuse, etc. This impacts on a child's long-term health outcomes when it occurs to them in the early years. Um, and if the parents are, are struggling and they're not aware of the impact of their issues on the children, it is really um, down to the local health services to be aware of the impact of this stress on the child's um, mental health at that age, but they, you don't tend to necessarily see it displaying itself in the child at that age. You'll see it over a long, over a long term in um, biological and other types of health problems. Um, so yeah, I would say that this is the time in the early years when the local health facilities particularly um, need to uh, be more aware and be ready to intervene. Well, um, I was supposed to ask the uh, one key takeaway, but ins instead of that, I'd probably ask each of the speakers here to name three major things for you about mental health, which you would love to keep 
repeating to the audience, to the public, to all the people? So I think sometimes people think if I'm not struggling and, you know, I still have a job and my family is comfortable that, you know, I wouldn't have any issues. But I think it's very clear that in high income, very successful families, there still can be depression, there still can be anxiety, and there's no reason to say I shouldn't have these feelings because, you know, my life is better than other people's. People have their feelings. Um, the other thing is, in that same vein, there's a resource that I shared on high functioning depression, where you may see a student who's getting the work done, uh, getting the application university doing what they have to but they still could be experiencing symptoms of the anxiety and depression but are keeping it bottled up so for parents i'd really be recommending looking at some of the changes if they're sleeping less sleeping more eating habits i mean everyone in a pandemic is affected somewhat but to really be able to tune in and, and going back to the younger years, one of the questions about what parents can do, I think many of us are brought up that if, if you're crying, the caregiver just wants to make you stop crying and does things to distract you. Whereas what we're really looking at for kids now is how can we say, gee, you're, you're crying, what's going on? Let's talk about it. And there's a lot of books where kids can identify, you know, with smiley face, frowny face, how people are feeling, identify their own feelings. So if we can start from the younger years, acknowledging that we all have these feelings, sometimes they're not pretty. Um, you know, you can be angry, you just can't throw things, but let's talk about what made you angry and coping skills. So I think there's a whole lot more than when I was a child growing up, they, you know, um, you're crying, uh, you know, stop crying or I'll give you something to cry about was something I heard, not, you know, why, why are you sad? So I think really looking at that and making normalizing talking about feelings would be really useful. And the other thing that I'll close with is what we're talking about, everyone has mental health. It's a continuum. It switches, we could be doing well in this phase, but not so well in another. And in terms of looking at students, a lot of the strategies we talked about with the self-care, the mindfulness, exercise, diet, all that, a lot of those, you really have to have a stable level of mental health to participate in that. If you're truly clinically depressed, if you're really severe anxiety, you might not be able to even get out of bed in the morning. And um, you know, as one of the previous speakers said, trying to tell someone who's so depressed, snap out of it, get up, go for a walk, do some exercise. I think we have to really be conscious of the whole continuum and where anyone or children, adults are on that continuum and know when it really is time for the professionals um, it's not, you know, we don't go to medication first, we don't go to a psychiatrist first, but if you're seeing a real pattern and, the, and not improvement over the time, I think, again, putting aside that stigma and saying, let me do the best for my child and let me look at some professional things because what we've been doing, you know, just doesn't seem to be working. So I just wanted to end with that. And also I wanted, I know your spring holidays are coming up. And a friend of mine um, in your country had told me that um, there's a nice ritual of jumping over the fire. And um, I, I'm just really, I wanna use that ritual and, and put COVID in the fire and move forward. So with the vaccinations, I'm hoping that we can move forward with some hope and that uh, we'll be you know, on the other side and able to, to move up the ladder in all of our mental health. And thanks so much for inviting me on the panel. Thanks a lot, Janet. I, I think like, you know, the fire for COVID needs to be really, really high and huge, but we wouldn't mind that. I mean, if that would help, we would get that fire all over the world just to be burned and make sure that we get rid of that. Thank you, Dale. 
So three things that I would really focus on at this point and, and take away from this panel discussion. Um, most things we've, we've discussed, I would say that cultivating positive relationships in your life with your friends, with your families, keep those friends close um, so that when things come up, you know, you have somebody to discuss it with. Balancing your physical and your mental health and wellness, so important. You know, the nutrition, the sleep, the physical activity, but also the other things about trying things new, being um, some relaxation techniques um, and mindfulness, very important. And then also the last thing would be to identify the resources that you have in your school and community. So when things do become more difficult for you to cope with or for your child to cope with, you have um, resources to go to. And if one doesn't work, go to the next one and just keep trying until you find the help that you need. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you for having me today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. It's great to have you here. Orhan, your three things about the mental health you want to, to, to, to, to tell the audience. Yeah, the first one for me is to breathe because the deep breathing reduces uh, the our body's levels of the stress hormones. And the second one for me is the exercise. Exercise also uh, very useful and um, reducing the stress hormones and pumping uh, pumping up the production of endorphin. And the third one for me is the meditate because meditation is uh, the, one of the simply act of quieting and opening the mind by focusing uh, by focusing uh, to our breath. Fantastic, thank you. Ali, we would move to you, your three takeaways. Actually, majority of the tips, useful tips, have already been told by our speakers. Uh, I wish to concentrate on concrete things. So the things which each adult or child can really do. So as mentioned before, it's a physical activity from 50 to 20 minutes cardio exercises per day, more than enough. For, for all of us. And uh, if you don't know how to do the exercises, just go YouTube, you can join our online platform, we do it for free. Uh, second thing uh, is how to stay mentally healthy is to study something new and apply this knowledge later because it affects on our uh, knowledge about the world. And the more we know, the more uh, we are ready for the difficulties like pandemic, you know. And the uh, third thing uh, is about uh, doing nothing. 20 from 50 to 20 minutes per day, just do nothing. Don't even think. Don't watch videos, don't watch to your phone, just don't do nothing. And uh, this time, during this period of uh, doing nothingness, uh, you know, some people waste their life to, to practice and be able to think about nothing. And uh, nowadays we know them as a yoga guru or some, some gurus. Uh, but it's okay if you, you cannot do it at the first time. And thousands of thoughts in our brain, uh, even, even scientists counted that there, there is about 40,000 thoughts in our brain per day. But majority of them are useless. So try to... to <laughs> <laughs> that was a good conclusion. Gwen, before you do nothing, or before you m try to manage to do nothing, what would be your three, if not tips, I'm like, you know, more, what would, you, what would be your three key messages to the audience about the mental health and the importance of that? Um, so I, my first message would be to fathers, um, not to be afraid of spending time with their children. Um, I think fathers often are worried. They do think, I don't know what to say, I don't know what to do. Doesn't matter. Your child will be so happy that you're just sitting down with them and just looking at what they're looking at on their telephone or, you know, on the TV or at a book or something. Just be a little interested in your child and uh, your child will respond so well. 
Um, then my second message would be to parents, um, put your child to bed earlier and get them into bed so they have a good long night's sleep and give yourself that time for a rest, yeah? And that will really help your parents, particularly mothers. It will give the mums that time to just rest and relax as well and uh, help your children to um, uh, be more calm the next day with a good amount of sleep. And those are my two main messages. Thanks for that. And Raman, before I switch to you, um, we just recently had an online Zoom and I hate calling, you know, all those like online conversations. I'm wishing and dreaming of the time when we come back to offline, to real energy, to real people. But we were talking uh, at Harvard's audience together with a good friend of mine, Nargis Nasrullah, and Gwen, you know her perfectly, about um, the th about the things about like you know how we're feeling right now during the pandemic, how we're suffering with like you know people who probably didn't even didn't even see anything in, in their problems. And I remember someone was quoting myself like, you know, in the Twitter afterwards, because we were pretty open and that was a kind of naked conversation on how we're feeling, how we're suffering, um, being locked at home, not knowing what's happening tomorrow, being, trying to be flexible, trying to be resilient, but really like, you know, at the same time crying and trying to, you know, to get all the resources together. And somebody was like, you know, um, repeating that, saying it's okay not to be okay, and I think you know for me that was a, like you know the key key out thing. It's really okay not to be okay. You don't need to be ideal. You don't need to expect your kids or your close one to overperform or to project your expectations on them, and that would probably make you know take that whole tough pressure out of them, and that will ease the conversation both with them and among the others about how important the mental health issues are. And probably the last word over to you as being the host of this conversation. Again, thank you for inviting us. Thank you for raising it up because this is like, you know, vital important for the community, for the society. I hope, you know, that will be just a good example set. So what are your three keys? Five, and as a host, you have like, you know, the right to have unlimited number of them. Okay, um, I'm, well, being, being the last contributor to this, I'll probably be even more brief than the other ones, but I'd like to say a big thank you to, for, for being um, involved, for the opportunity. It's been a real privilege to listen to uh, out and out mental health specialists sharing their wisdom and their, you know, their, their advice. So I, I would say, listen to the people who've spoken before me. That's my first uh, piece of advice. Uh, the second point I'd like to make is to echo what Tatiana said. We all have mental health. It's okay not to be okay. And mental health is a continuum, as Janet said. Uh, it's not binary. You're not sick uh, or well. You're not broken or healthy. Your mental health will fluctuate. And at a time like this, it's absolutely normal uh, and human to be feeling uh, more of a balance of negative emotions. Um, and. The, the last piece of advice is, is somewhat obvious. Uh, a small change can make a big difference. Um, that there can be an attitude that with any, any new subject, there's no point scratching the surface unless you're gonna be an out and out expert. And I think mental health, like physical health, is not like that. If you do take the time to educate yourself about your own or your children's mental health and make some small changes, so cherry pick from the, the, f the five ways to well-being pick the things that work for you. You may not be a meditation person, but you may be able to find a, a, um, some meaning in the advice about connection or the meaning uh, in the advice about uh, charity work and altruism. So, you know, do engage with the subject on whatever level you can. Give whatever small piece of time you can to it because being 10% happier can make a really big difference. Thanks a lot. Um, again, thank you for bringing us all together and not in the, like, you know, that's probably one of the major reasons why I love pandemic is just like being able to communicate and to share uh, this with the people from all over the world because again, we're all humans and we're all sharing the same issues. And I think together we can easily overcome uh, those things. Thanks a lot to everyone and thank you for being with us today.